Hello, welcome back to theCUBE's coverage here in New York City on the show floor of the New York Stock Exchange. This is theCUBE's location at the NYSE. This is our East Coast access point for ex access to information, experts, and all the people making things happen. Our next guest, Stephen Elliott, who's the CFO of Adams Networks. Stephen, welcome to theCUBE. Thank you for having Thanks me. Thanks for coming on here. We're Wall Street, this is where business and technology intersect. CUBE in Silicon Valley, here now in New York City at the NYSE. You know, the business conversation is all about AI, obviously, but this week, Climate Week at UN, the conversation opens up into kind of your world, which is, okay, I got to govern this, I got to explain the AI, I got to make sure we're safe and secure and defend against all threats, foreign and domestic, so to speak. <laughs> um, you know, cybersecurity is a hot topic. It's a data problem and a risk management problem. And this is really, when you, when you boil it up, it kind of comes into those categories. Because you got to have the governance on the data, you also want to secure it. Yeah. Because the surface area is now very porous. Yes. And so defense has changed. The bad guys are getting stronger. The good guys got Gen AI helping them out. So you're seeing socks change, sims change. You're seeing the personnel, the craft of cyber change. So you got the personnel, the process, the technology. It sounds like a digital transformation <laughs> equation. Uh, <laughs> welcome to theCUBE. Thank you, yeah, it also sounds slightly terrifying. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Explain Adam's Networks, what you guys do, the business model real quick, and we can jump in. Yeah, so Adam Networks is, uh, it's 11 years in the making, and started trying to solve the problem of how do we confidently connect to the internet that only we want to connect to. The internet is obviously a very big thing, a billion plus URLs and growing every day, most of it malicious depending on how you measure it. So the idea was from our founding engineers was asking the question, why are we spending computing power tracking the bad when most of the bad isn't something we need to connect to or worry about anyway? How can we spend computing power noting and connecting to the good, uh, however we define that, uh, on a per device basis so that we can allow the administrator to sculpt a unique version of the internet for each and every device. So then the, the, it's a default denial um, network edge solution that can be deployed in the cloud and can be deployed on-prem. I run it right now on a forced on VPN on my phone, um, deployed in a lot of different models. But basically the idea is how can we just allow the good to connect and then by default the bad C2 nodes um, just simply don't exist. Yeah, so you guys are actually creating policy around access and then verifying connections? We're allowing, so the, the, the critical pieces of the tech um, are, it's a DNS filtering solution. So we use DNS as a root of trust. Um, there's a problem with that, or there was a problem with that, because DNS can be leaky. Yeah. So what happens if you have a device that's using a direct IP connection and not using DNS lookup? So that's solved uh, in part by one of our patents called Don't Talk to Strangers, DTTS. Yeah. Yeah. So when you're behind Atom 1, any device that's trying to make a direct IP connection must first go through the single door of DNS, verify that, and then, and only then, if it is verified by the policy for that device, is a connection made. So that shuts down shadow IT, it shuts down the leakiness of DNS, um, and then we're giving complete visibility. So because we sit on the wire on the network edge, automatically you have complete device inventory of anything that's trying to connect to your network. You're building basically a, a virtual perimeter or physical perimeter by collection, the collection of devices. Yeah, we're allowed, the network. we're allowing the administrator to do that. They see it in real time um, immediately, and, and oftentimes, there's devices that are connecting to the network, they had no idea. Uh, yeah. <laughs> they get to see that uh, immediately when oops. they start roll out. It's got a processor and it's got multi-threaded on it. Okay, oops. That's right. Malware That's right. opportunity. So take us through the, um, the evolution on the business side because we're seeing on our research clearly that the edge uh, devices are, are exploding in, in population. Yeah. You're seeing a lot, the form factor change from wearables to even you know, multimodal computer vision cameras to whatever, right. light bulbs, I and mean, everything's going to have IP address. As the device tsunami come, continues yeah. to come, how does that impact your business and how does customers react to that? What's their, what's their play? It's very positive, especially since uh, we don't have to download the software on an endpoint. So anything that is IoT uh, can live behind Atom1 you know, very, very well. I came uh, briefly, just in terms of my own you know, association with Atom, I came to Atom Networks running um, a financial services company uh, seven years ago trying to solve for phishing. And so um, we were starting to get more sophisticated phishing emails coming into um, our network. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm not a technologist, I'm a business guy, but I understood very quickly that if my staff and my, our, my company is one bad click away from opening a C2 node, then that's a problem. And I'm not sleeping very well at night. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the answers that I was getting from MS SSPs were essentially, well, we were happy to do seminars to help train them to not click on the link. 
And I said, that does not make me feel a whole lot better. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So as I, as I met uh, the team at Adam at that point, um, had just, uh, this is 2018, they had just taken the product live after six years of development. Uh, it just made way too much sense to me. I was too dumb from a tech standpoint to know the difference, yeah, to yeah. say, why, why would I worry about the bad that I don't know about? Yeah. Why don't we just cut that uh, from the root? And so, um, so the, the conversation, unfortunately, the, the bad actors, which are multiplying, um, are doing a tremendous amount yeah. for our business. Um, and so we're happy to serve the clients in that, but we also lament the yeah. fact that the state of affairs are yeah, what they and are. And the, the um, AI's helped the, certainly the phishing business. Yeah. And ransomware as a service is growing. Yes. Criminal networks are getting disrupted, reconstituting themselves, moving yes. very quickly. Um, does that really solve that problem? Because it sounds like phishing would be eliminated then so you know there's no solution that there's no silver bullet right we exist in an ecosystem uh, yeah. and we we deploy and work with other partners but um, when you can move to basically a posture that we assume you are breached and yeah. that's that's position one then basically you take your tax surface has been reduced depending on how you want to do the math if your average organization needs yeah. about 15,000 URLs and there's a billion plus URLs on the internet, you've reduced your attack surface by 7,000 times. So our goal is to make the attack surface so small that you've exhausted yeah. the resources of your attacker. So yeah, we can uh, we, we encourage people, we encourage if my, my daughter at home gets a phishing link on her Atom One phone, the first thing I say is, let me see it, click on it. Let me see it, I want to see it. And it, it doesn't work. Um, not because we know the link is bad. It just hasn't gone through the DNS. It's just not part of that device's version yeah. of the internet. So this is, I mean, this is basically a concept that makes total sense. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the reaction on the customer side? Because you have them investing in massive security, red teams, blue teams, socks, right. sims. So what's the productivity look like? What changes on the customer side? Um, a lot. So part of it is, I mean, it's been a, it's been a five year journey on the business side to tell the story and to actually go to market. Um, and part of that journey is just learning how to talk about our product and what people what people are trying to solve, which ransomware is certainly a big one. So part of the challenge uh, initially, you know, was number one, who are you? Um, <laughs> and so that's yeah. obviously the challenge that any incumbent has yeah. uh, or any upstart has coming into a market. But then the the second third order questions um, are really around deployment. Mm -hmm. um, we're not seeking necessarily to supplant other network edge providers. Yeah. We play nicely with others. So there's a lot of questions around that. And then there's just questions around which are really good questions of um, how big and how wieldy is your stack getting. Yeah. And so you have to be you have to be very clear about what and listen a lot yeah. about what are you what do you actually care yeah. about where are you at in your procurement cycle where is your spend you may love our solution but you're not going to have budget for it for 18 months yeah. and so that's okay um, so yeah it's really uh, and, and by the way they have tons of platforms correct i've been buying every tool on the planet correct every platform i mean i was talking to a customer and they said to me you know john one of the biggest things that we have here is that if we had a breach and it started to take hold we can't unplug right they can't that's even right. get off the internet that's right. I mean, that is like, that is mind blowing because it's so convoluted in the systems, they can't actually shut down because it's a critical emergency and then right. mitigate, yeah. triage, and then roll back yeah. and put things back in place. That's right, yeah. Because the systems aren't talking to each other and it's like, I mean, we all saw what happened in the past, uh, in this past year. Yeah. I mean, recovery mm -hmm. is a problem. Yeah. So defending, then recovering. So it's, resilience is a huge focus. Yeah, I, I think that would be like a wake up call for you guys um, to get at the front of the line on yeah, everything. It happens like, unfortunately we had um, a, uh, we, it's a client, uh, it's, a, it's a firm that we did a partial deployment on three years ago um, and a quote was uh, out and our conversations been stalled because they were ransomed a week ago. Um, and so on a part of their network that we were not protecting. And it's not to say, I cannot say conclusively that had we been deployed, I, you know, without knowing all the details, but the bottom line is the, our most motivated buyers are the ones who've gotten religion around the fact that this includes them too. Yeah. And that's, I think that's part of the... And by the way, ransomware sees a sucker, they'll come back and go after it again. Just goes right back up. So we have, uh, we have one client, uh, their uh, multi-condom manufacturing concern. Um, we were brought into the conversation three years ago, and as we were quoting, um, they were in the middle of a, of a breach. And so basically what happened was we deployed Atom One uh, at their network edges and their facilities. Um, they lost one weekend shift, stayed connected to the internet. We didn't know the infected machine. We didn't have to. 
Um, so they stayed connected to the internet, and only that which was verified and good and necessary continued to connect. They lost one weekend shift, didn't pay the ransom, and the controller on one of their manufacturing yeah. floors that was still running, and to this day is still running the same unpatched Windows XP system, we've tracked somewhere on the order of 5,000 reinfection attempts on that machine, and we watch it, we see it on the logs, yeah, yeah. it just can't connect. Yeah. And so that's, a, that's what we can it's do. It's an ultimate quarantine. Correct. I mean, you guys are innovative, and you guys take the policy of guilty <laughs> until proven innocent. That's right. I mean, but that works. And it's the That's same the protocol policy. that will work. It's the same policy that I use in protecting my children. Yeah. Right. Exactly. It's like this is how we do not talk to strangers. Period. Yeah. And so, why would we not use that protocol yeah. for the devices that are? So okay. Bad. So, what do you guys are doing now? Because obviously, it's a great value proposition. Again, that would for me in front of the line. You know, because mm -hmm. you know, everyone's standing in line. Hey, you know, I got a solution. Yeah. Got a platform. We got another tool, and the tool shed in cyber is like. Right. Like, I mean, I bought something three years ago, is it still deployed? I don't even know what I have on my network. That's right. So there's a lot of com a lot of congestion. Yes. But the contention is to solve the problem. Yes. What are you guys doing about it? What's the business plan? Business plan is, so we are already deployed on about two million devices, um, small, medium-sized enterprises. Uh, we just went into the banking sector this first quarter with our first banking client. So we're continuing to grow validation with larger and larger, more complex deployments. We have a licensed technology partner program, LTPs, so we ultimately do not want to be a distribution company. Mm -hmm. We'll distribute insofar as we have to build a business case, mm -hmm. but we want to resell and license to other MSPs yeah. and MSSPs, so that program is growing rapidly. Um, and then we're uh, we're in the early stages of making inroads into USG. Is the objection too good to be true, or is it people just like, why hasn't someone thought about this? Um, or what's the secret sauce? It's it's some of that, and then it's also, um, it's also a little bit, um, depending on the audience, it's also a little bit of somebody hears default and I all and their blood pressure spikes and they say, you're going to break everything. Yeah. So like, no They're thanks. not ready for it. Basically. They're not ready for it. Um, and so, yeah. And then it's also the, you can see sometimes the overload of you have eight tools, like you said, that I'm not even fully using and now I'm supposed to listen to you guys, right? So yeah. there's just a lot of congestion um, and it is a, it is, there is a too good to be true element to it where yeah. how have you actually gotten this to work? And the answer is a really talented group of engineers who for six years, um, kept working on it. Give some history in the company. Where are you guys based out of? What are you guys working on now? Yeah. Uh, status of the company? Give yeah. us an update. Yeah, the company was founded in 2013 by David Redekop, he's chief engineer, um, and we have, our, our staff has doubled in the last year. We got about uh, 25 employees, and that's continuing to grow. Yes. Um, yeah, we're expanding into the U.S. market, and have clients yeah. in multiple continents, and the Business future, is good? Business is good, it's, <laughs> it's, it's very bright. Yeah. Good, a lot of dry powder? Yeah, uh, we're, we're uh, that's one of the reasons I'm in New York, so you can never have too much sometimes. Yeah, but, yeah it's a good uh, time to raise. I mean, again, the defense side, the threat intelligence market, um, having the intelligence, but actionable yes. capabilities. Yes. At the end of the day, you can have all the intelligence you want. That's right. And there's information sharing, Yeah. but if you don't have that mission control, you can't detect and respond, which is the key eth ethos of defense. Yeah. You're already built in the detection yeah, by assuming should don't talk to strangers. Breaches. Yeah, and the basic idea is we help win the cyber war by simply removing your assets from the battlefield. So it's almost, in some respects, because we've been trained, um, I used to be in the military, so like the idea of who's the adversary, where do I fight the adversary, yeah. the ultimate way to win is to achieve your objectives without having to fire a shot. And that's what we want to do. Um, because at the end of the day, and it's not to say that threat detection doesn't have a role, um, again, there's an ecosystem um, yeah. uh, of all of this, uh, but, um, but yeah, we feel like, unfortunately, the, the threat ecosystem is going to drive adoption of a model like What's ours. What's the hurdles for you, getting the word out, awareness, is there agent involved, agent technology, does that slow the boot up process? What's the technical product um, requirements, and where's the innovation? Yeah, I mean, it's basically, the, the first step is just understanding you know, what the client ecosystem is and what they're trying to protect. So do they want a cloud deployment exclusively? Do they want an on-premise deployment? Do they want some combination of the two? Um, so honestly, one of the biggest hurdles sometimes is in order to understand where the egress points are, um, first and foremost, your prospect and client has to understand that. And so oftentimes, um, when we're yeah. at the beginning of the process, sometimes there's a little bit of a sheepish conversation around, we know that there's some configuration things we need to clean up so that we can have real clarity on the yeah. doors. And that's not, unfortunately, a problem we can't solve. Yeah. But um, once it is solved, then, then we're in a position to help. Talk about what you guys are investing in right now. Honestly, um, what round of funding are you guys at now? Yeah, we're closing our seed and then looking towards Series A in 2025. Okay. So, okay, cool, that's awesome. Any investors out there, check it out. Um, another opportunity to solve the problem. Uh, on the go-to-market, take us through the use cases of the customer. Okay, I'm interested, you got my attention, all right. Right. Yeah. 
I love it. Yeah. How do I, what, what do I do? Yeah. Like scope the magnitude of the engagement. Yeah, so we start, uh, we'll start with the POC. Um, and usually like, I'll just walk you through kind of how it worked with, uh, with our last new banking client. So first, what they wanted to do um, was uh, they wanted their own sandbox in the cloud so that their CISO could spend a weekend trying to break it. And so, That's good. Uh, I love CISOs who are red teaming. Which is great. So <laughs> yeah. once he was convinced that um, DTTS worked and that it did what it said it was going to do, um, we deployed, then it was, here's your network, architect we need network architecture, we need to know um, how many endpoints, how many devices, are we protecting phones, are we protecting multi-homes, Is how many branches are we protecting, where do you want to start? So the client tells us where they want to start, they give us that architecture, um, then we come back with a quote and what we call a smart rollout plan. Because the ideal is not to deploy Atom 1 and then immediately go to a full zero trust default denial posture. That's where you break things. The first thing that we do is we like to turn on Atom 1 for between 30 to 90 days in listen mode. So what we're doing is, number one, we're capturing all your devices that are actually connecting to the internet. Yeah. And then we're capturing what is a quote unquote normal traffic pattern for these different parts of your organization. What does a normal traffic pattern look like for sales? What does it look like for your ATMs or whatever it is? And then from there, the CISO has the freedom in their team to ratchet down to a posture of least permissiveness without mm -hmm. breaking anything. And that process, depending on how fast they want to go, they can be from you know, POC to fully up and running with Adam, usually about 120 days. But so not a heavy lift on deployment. Once you understand the architecture, get Correct. the POCs, that's really more about confidence. Yeah. And you guys getting some working data around just the infrastructure that they have. Correct, and in that case, uh, they were also running um, Palo and Cisco Umbrella, um, and they did not have to disconnect from any of those. We can yeah. run in line with those or outside of those, um, so we, we play well with others. Uh, it's interesting, the endpoint, there's like 13 categories in security these days. Right. You know, endpoint's one of the hot ones, yeah. I also mentioned that. Um, you guys solved that problem, and so I can imagine that there's been a lot of demand yes. uh, for this. Yes. Um, how do you speed up the process, and how do you mitigate that fear might be unfounded around things breaking in, and what, would they, what are they afraid of? Um, I think they're afraid of an over-reliance on a company they've never heard of. Very few people have, I don't know, have ever gotten fired for you know, using a, a billion dollar company. Until, and we're they not get, that yet. until they get breached. Correct. <laughs> and so um, you're, you're, you're fighting that, you're fighting the, the confidence factor, which we totally understand. Um, you're fighting, you know, like we talked about, just the fact that there's a plethora of tools and I'm already understaffed in terms of what I'm doing, so how do I, Theoretically, I want to do it, but resourcing how do I, up, resourcing up, and then it's also yeah. you have to have the successful deployments that we've had, which all of our, I mean, I would consider all of our deployments to be successful. You have to have tech, technology buy-in from your technical team, and you have to have business buy-in because where we've seen gaps is if you just have the technical buy-in and you have the board or the C-suite just sort of nodding their head, the problem is you have a gap in culture because our product works best, like any product, when you have cultural buy-in that says, yeah. we're writing the check and we're deploying this, because that's an outward expression of the fact that we, we get the landscape we're living in, and we want to take those steps. If we're just considered another tool in the stack, then it can, it, it, it can be underutilized, yeah. I should say. Yeah, one of the things, I'll come to the user experience potential impact, if any, want to talk about that, but you brought up a good point that we see where people fail and where people succeed in cyber, on the defense side is when they adopt an, like an IT mindset, oh, we got a new stack, we're good, but they don't change the process. Yeah. So this, this is, to your, I think this is your culture point. It's culture, it's huge. You got to have the, the new capabilities, AKA Atom Networks, yeah. Atom One, and then process, Yeah. this is how we operate. Yeah, that's, that's right. operational. That's not about technical, it's both theaters. That's exactly right. Yeah, it, it, people have to have buy-in and have to, have not and, and not from a position of fear. You don't want to inject a persistent anxiety into your organization that China is right at your door, even though they kind of they already, are. They already they got the anxiety. There. Right, but it's, <laughs> it's like, level of anxiety. Yeah, how do we empower? Yeah. And you know, obviously you can deploy Atom or any other solution, and if I don't have good security hygiene, and I pick up the phone and I just wire money to whomever, well that's, that's a problem. Yeah. Like there's no, there's no solution that can fix that. The human being, we're, we're always the weakest link in the solution, in, in the chain, and we just want to help people, um, especially in a world of AI, and especially when you're talking about phishing and ransomware, it's so unfair to expect a human being to say, you're one click away from bringing the organization down. That's just not fair. Yeah. And so we, we can certainly help, help so solve So some that. of the user experience, obviously, you know, work at, working at home, that's a whole other challenge. Mm -hmm. um, devices, I got my iPhone or Android yep. phone, I've got more work apps on there. Uh, certainly it's an endpoint. 
Is there disruption there on the user side? What happens to the user? Does, yeah. it, does it have a mode that senses when they're in work mode? And you can you can design different policies around that. There's there's a whole host of tools on the dashboard in terms of how you sculpt the sculpt yeah. the experience. But to give you like kind of two broad spectrum examples. So again, the idea of sculpting your own unique version of the mm -hmm. internet for each individual device. My HP printer is on a very narrow version of the internet. It cannot talk to Bank of America, right? It is, it is on a static whitelist that I can see from my dashboard from anywhere, and it can talk and get software updates. That's it. My phone, my laptop, is on what we would call the most aggressive version that's much more driven by AI and machine learning because we're, as I'm going to new places and using new apps, then I have to leverage the robots to go in front of me because I may not have been there before. Yeah. So is that safe? They go to the Cube AI, maybe for the first time to check out our, our, AP, our stuff. That might not be whitelisted. Correct. And but so, but we use, and this is a component of the stack, so we're we're very much like threat detection is really important. Part of what part of our product is a product called DNS Harmony, where we think that the only um, uh, the only better or the best threat intelligence feed is an aggregation of all the best threat intelligence feeds. So you can use DNS Harmony for a device, which is a blacklisting approach, but it aggregates all the top threat intel feeds. But then we use DNS Harmony as a component to train our robots to basically say, yes, this is you know, updated by the second to help make decisions as to whether or not a new place you're going yeah. is safe or not. And at the end of the day, we're always making this decision with any product between convenience and security. Yeah. I, if I put my phone on a static whitelist and I could only go to those devices, that is a very secure posture and I would quickly have a brick that I would not be able to use. And so we're, we're helping people at least make that risk management decision for yeah. themselves. We're not here to tell you what's good, quote unquote. You get to make yeah. that decision and you get to turn the dials as to you know, how, how tight that posture is yeah. for your network. You know, one of the things that comes up a lot is third party services like APIs, Web pages have a third party element to it, they're coming from a foreign right. device. What if my site was infected and becomes whitelisted and I'm pushing malware through my URL? Yeah, that's a risk. Um, and that's where that's where the threat intel feed again, we can't we can't posit that we're gonna stop every there's always an attack vector, right? Yeah. Uh, there's always a way to get through. Um, we do have some some ways that we can help address that, but at the end of the day it's about attack surface reduction. Right, it's, yeah. it's, and that's why some other tools working in concert with ours can be really helpful. Okay, that was my next question because this comes into, you're not a replace all. No. You are a integrate into the environment. Correct. With layered approach by one, focusing on the surface area. Yes. And letting other tools be best of breed in their class if Correct. they need them. Correct, that's exactly right. Okay, cool. All right, well that sounds awesome to me. Um, any room in your next round for the Cube Ventures? Oh my goodness, yeah. we don't have a venture fund. <laughs> if we did it, we would invest. Um, uh, great solution. Give a give a quick um, commercial for the people watching. Um, what you guys are looking for and the funding, yeah. hiring, customers, uh, value proposition. Give give a quick pitch. Yeah. So we are uh, we're finishing up a seed round right now. That's again one one of the reasons I'm meeting with some folks here. Um, so uh, finishing up another two and a half million a seed. Looking at about ten million in Series A for next year. Um, we are seeking to grow our deployment um, and client services team, so we'll probably be adding um, at least a dozen hires over the course of the next six months. If the only thing worse than not getting the business is getting the business and not being able to do well with it. Yeah. So that's part of the reason for investment is we want to run ahead of the demand that we're continuing to it see It sounds grow. like you're in the super seed category with product market fit now yeah. holding on the front end. Yeah. We're weird market. because people look at us and it's just like, wait, you've, this is 11 years old and you've got yeah. clients. It's the, it's so true. stuff was itself funded by the founders? Yeah. Pretty much, yeah. yeah. So that's what usually, ha usually happens on the good deals. Exactly. So you just, you're a seed bridge basically into an A. You got it. Once you get escape velocity on the A, then you'll raise more money. So you guys take a more conservative approach with the seed, is that the? That's thing? the idea. Yeah, that's the idea. Because we have so much in the pipeline right now in the sales pipeline, it's very chunky and that's the best money you can have. And yeah. so uh, we don't want to raise any more than we have to, but at the same time, uh, yeah. you know, that's my job. So you're generating to, revenue. Yes. You got customers. Yes. You got product market fit. You understand the landscape. The world is uh, on tailwind for you, this market. Yeah. Obviously. Yeah, that's right. correct. That's all correct. Right. Well, thanks for coming on the Cube. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. All right, getting all the action again. Defense is one of the biggest, hottest areas in in cybersecurity. Again, it's securing the data. It's a risk management. Um, new approaches are coming online. They're happening here on the Cube. We are here in our NYSC studio location. I'm John Furrier, your host of the Cube. Thanks for watching. <laughs>